and, and I think I've met most of you on Patricia Lanou, and it's, it's just uh, something we want to continue to do, and this is actually Eric Brown's idea, is to have discussions on interesting topics and bring students together just to have ice cream and, and to get an introduction to a topic and then open it up for your ideas and your questions. And so it's going to be casual right. and um, Absolutely. hopefully I mean, entertaining. One of the things that a college campus needs, in my opinion, are opportunities for students to talk to each other, to talk to faculty in a casual way, not in a way that's going to be graded or evaluated, but to talk through issues and issues that I, I think are crit critically important for who we are and what we're becoming. And this topic the, uh, for our first conversation on sort of prostheses and how the, the, the technological and scientific advances of prostheses are changing our very notions of what it means to be disabled. Um, profoundly. And so what we're going to do is start off with um, about 10 minutes worth of video. It's a TED Talk by a woman named Amy Mullins. Um, Amy Mullins is a para-Olympian and also a model and spokeswoman now. She was born without tibia and as a result lost, uh, uh, had to have removed the limbs beneath her knees, her legs beneath her knees. But what she has embodied, despite or perhaps because of that radical change in who she is and who she, who she is, is a, a very different idea of what she can be and how we in, 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 in modern society should see her. So we're going to listen and, and, and look at her. Um, I shouldn't have told you that she um, was a double amputee because it will be difficult to tell initially. All right, if the thing is going to play, oh, come on. Speaking to a group of about 300 kids, ages 6 to 8, at a children's museum, and I brought with me a bag full of legs, similar to the kinds of things you see up here, and had them laid out on a table um, for the kids. And from my experience, you know, kids are naturally curious about what they don't know or don't understand or is foreign to them. They only learn to be frightened of those differences when an adult influences them to behave that way and maybe censors that natural curiosity or, you know, reigns in the question asking for the, in the hopes of them being polite little kids. So, I mean, I, could have, I just pictured a first grade teacher out in the lobby with these unruly kids saying, now whatever you do, don't stare at her legs. But of course, that's the point. That's why I was there. I wanted to invite them to look and explore. So I made a deal with the adults that the kids could come in without any adults for two minutes on their own. The doors open, the kids descend on this table of legs, and they are poking and prodding, and they're wiggling toes, and they're trying to put their full weight on the sprinting leg to see what happens with that. And I said, kids, really quickly, I woke up this morning, I decided I wanted to be able to jump over a house. Nothing too big, two or three stories, but if you can think of any animal, any superhero, any cartoon character, anything you can dream up right now, what kind of leg would you build me? And immediately, a boy shouted, kangaroo, no, 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 it should be a frog, no, it should be Go Go Gadget, no, 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 it should be uh, The Incredibles, and other things that I don't, aren't familiar with. And then one eight-year-old said, hey, uh, why wouldn't you want to fly, too? And the whole room, including me, was like, yeah. And just like that, I went from being a woman that these kids would have been trained to see as disabled to somebody who had potential that their bodies didn't have yet, 
somebody that might even be super able. Interesting. So some of you actually saw me at TED 11 years ago, and um, you know there's been a lot of talk about how life-changing this conference is for both speakers and attendees, and I am no exception. TED literally was a launch pad uh, to the next decade of my life's exploration. At the time, the legs I presented were groundbreaking in prosthetics. I had woven carbon fiber sprinting legs mounted up the hind leg of a cheetah, which you may have seen on stage yesterday. And um, also these very lifelike, intrinsically tainted silicone legs. So at the time, it was my opportunity to put a call out to innovators outside the traditional medical prosthetic community to come bring their talent to the science and to the art of building legs that we can stop compartmentalizing form, function, and aesthetic and assigning them different values. Well, lucky for me, a lot of people answered that call. Um, and the journey started, funny enough, with a TED conference attendee, Chi Perlman, who hopefully is in the audience somewhere today. She was the editor then of a magazine called ID, and she gave me a cover story. This started an incredible journey. Curious encounters were happening to me at the time. I've been accepting <coughs> numerous invitations to speak on the design of the cheetah legs around the world. And people would come up to me after the conference, after my talk, men and women, and the conversation would go something like this. You know, Amy, you're very attractive. You don't look disabled. <sighs> I thought, well, that's amazing, because I don't feel disabled. <laughs> and you know, it really opened my eyes to this conversation that could be explored about beauty. What does a beautiful woman have to look like? What is a sexy body? And interestingly, from an identity standpoint, what does it mean to have a disability? I mean, people, Pamela Anderson has more prosthetic in her body than I do. Nobody calls her disabled. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this magazine, through the hands of graphic designer Peter Stavel, went to fashion designer Alexander McQueen and photographer Nick Knight, who were also interested in exploring that conversation. So three months after TED, I found myself on a plane to London doing my first fashion shoot. It resulted in this cover, Fashion Able. Three months after that, I did my first runway show for Alexander McQueen on a pair of hand-carved wooden legs made from solid ash. Nobody knew. Everyone thought they were wooden boots. Actually, I have them on stage with me. Grapevines, magnolias, truly stunning. Poetry matters. Poetry is what elevates the banal and neglected object to a realm of art. It can transform the thing that might have made people fearful into something that invites them to look and look a little longer and maybe even understand. I learned this firsthand with my next adventure, the artist Matthew Barney in his film opus called The Cream Master Cycle. This is where it really hit home for me, that my legs could be wearable sculpture. And even at this point, I started to move away from the need to replicate humanness as the only aesthetic ideal. So we made what people lovingly refer to as glass legs, even though they're actually optically clear polyurethane, aka bowling ball material. Then we made these legs that are cast in soil with a um, potato root system growing in them and beet roots at the top and a very lovely grass toe. It's a good close-up of that one. Then another character was a half woman, half cheetah, a little homage to my life as an athlete. 14 hours of prosthetic makeup to get into a creature that had articulated paws, claws, and a tail that whipped around like a gecko. <laughs> um, and then another pair of legs we collaborated on were these. Look like jellyfish legs, also polyurethane. And the only purpose that these legs can serve outside the context of the film is to provoke the senses and ignite the imagination. So whimsy matters. Today, I have over a dozen pair of prosthetic legs that various people have made for me. And with them, I have different negotiations of the terrain under my feet, and I can change my height. I have a variable of five different heights. 
Um, today I'm six one, and I had these legs made a little over a year ago at a dorsal orthopedic in England. And when I brought them home to Manhattan, my first night out in the town, I went to a very fancy party, and a girl was there who has known me for years at my normal five eight. Her mouth dropped open when she saw me, and she went, "But you're so tall." And I said, I know, isn't it fun? I mean, I know it's a little bit like wearing stilts on stilts, but I have an entirely new relationship to door jams that I never expected I would ever have. And I was having fun with it. And she looked at me and she said, but Amy, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> and the incredible thing was she really meant it. It's not fair that you can change your height as you want it. And that's when I knew, that's when I knew that the conversation with society has changed profoundly in this last decade. It is no longer a conversation about overcoming deficiency. It's a conversation about augmentation. It's a conversation about potential. A prosthetic limb doesn't represent the need to replace loss anymore. It can stand as a symbol that the wearer has the power to create whatever it is that they want to create in that space. So people that society once considered to be disabled can now become the architects of their own identities and indeed continue to change those identities by designing their bodies from a place of empowerment. And what is exciting to me so much right now is that by combining cutting edge technology robotics, bionics, with the age-old poetry, we are moving closer to understanding our collective humanity. I think that if we want to discover the full potential in our humanity, we need to celebrate those heartbreaking strengths and those glorious disabilities that we all have. I think of Shakespeare's Shylock. If you prick us, do we not bleed? And if you tickle us, do we not laugh? It is our humanity and all the potential within it that makes us beautiful. Thank you. So, let me start off by asking now that you've seen Amy got a sense of, of, of where she's coming from and where we're kind of coming from. If you could design your own legs, let's say you needed prosthetic legs, let's ask the question on the poster. If you could design your leg. What would you want? Would you want them to look, let's imagine you'd lost your legs, you had legs. Would you want them to look just like the legs you had? Would you want them to be different? Would you want multiple? I would actually want it to look like as if I didn't have a peanut butter, because I want to attract attract attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you wouldn't want to attract attention, so you would. Them to Why wouldn't you want to attract attention? Um, I can, uh, so I, I get very uncomfortable and I don't like, I don't like when people stare at my, so my sister, she has Down syndrome mm -hmm. and just growing up, I've always been irritated when people are scared and, you know, mm -hmm. so like, I kind of just, that's just how I do. Like, I play, like, it's secure, bother easily, irritate easily. Okay. Anybody else? What would you, what would you want? I would want to be faster. You, you, would, <laughs> you would want to be faster. Like a lot faster or, you know, like a little bit faster? <laughs> <laughs> like a little bit faster. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
play a sound, I would build sound into the feet. I'd be able to articulate the feet so that my right foot could make, I mean, maybe even a couple of sounds. My toes could make a bass drum sound and my heel could make a cymbal sound. I'd make my legs musical if I could do it. I have multiple answers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One is I would like to have, um, they're not really legs, but the uh, lower extremities of a dolphin. I love to swim. Oh. And I just love the motion that they make. If I could embody that, fully experience that, I would love that. Um, and the other thing, I kind of want to turn this inside out in a way, because I actually have a disability in my life, but you don't see it. Mm -hmm. So I have loose ligaments in my mm -hmm. body from a genetic disorder. So I look normal, but I don't feel normal. I have a lot of pain, and I can't do things that I used to do. So I'd like to have um, I I'd like to have exactly my legs, but with a different interior. That didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the the other thing is not completely responsive to this, but it, it, it right, I'm thinking about this, and your answer brought it up, where I feel like the dis disability isn't necessarily about function, but it's about um, how one um, feels within or outside of group. Mm -hmm. You know, so and she's trying to break through that, but um, just, yeah, throw that out. Anybody else? What would you want? Surely you have some deep, dark secret or something <laughs> that you would want. Maybe. You know what I. I oh, yes. Um, I wouldn't want human like legs, but I would want you to be well sculpted okay. just because if you didn't go to the gym, you don't <laughs> not, not looking in shape. So you want the like perfectly sculpted yeah. human legs. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Patricia, what would you want? Oh my goodness. I I uh I'm sitting here thinking about this for the first time. <laughs> I would want legs that didn't break. I have osteoporosis. So if for those of you who don't know what that is, my bones are hollower than they should be. And so, and I've seen people that break limbs and so forth, and it's very painful and disability. So I, I would want legs that didn't break. I, I also would let, want legs that might be able to perform functions in the garden. <laughs> perform? For example, <laughs> if I could go like this and Weed. somehow or another plant a bulb or <laughs> take, out, take out a weeds or whatever, <laughs> that I would wear weeds that did a little housekeeping, a little gardening. <laughs> You know, or maybe they just had spikes so you could aerate the ground. I'm past over. the age of wanting beautiful legs, <laughs> <laughs> but I would want legs that are, you know, more functional than mm -hmm. than the human leg is right now. Right. And clearly, I don't want them to hurt, and I don't want them to break, and I don't care if I'm fast. <laughs> Until my granddaughter, you know, grows up and then I can't catch her or whatever. <laughs> but maybe then I'll change my mind. A bit of a, a, a just moving just a little bit. Oh, come in for ice cream? Moving a little bit just past this. Not only if you could design your legs, what if you had to design your legs? What if there was an accident for you? Or what if there was some issue for you and you had to design your legs? There's no choice. You have to have some kind of legs. What would you want? Would you, you, you would want something that looked just like it, 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 you, your legs looked before. But that's form. And we I haven't broken down form and function. Would you want them to function just the way your legs had done before? <laughs> so you're like, yeah, look, I, what I've got is just absolutely fine. Form and function is absolutely fine. But uh, maybe if you maybe if you had loose ligaments, you you wouldn't want you wouldn't want the frailties that your legs had. Actually, I would want some. Yeah, I would actually be a little bit strong because I know when I swim, I'm not strong enough, and so I get leg cramps when I swim. <laughs> so you'd want a little bit of added functionality with that. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe 
just maybe you would experiment with those dolphin flipper things that she oh, had. Those are good. Yeah. <laughs> you would share a pair. Yeah. <laughs> so if you if you had to, if you had to, would your legs would you want your legs to look like they look now? Would you want the form to be the same? Would you want form and function to be the same? Would you want form but different function? Would you want something beautiful like some of those legs that, that, that Amy Mullins had? What do you think? Anybody, what do you think? I'll just say for myself, I would need about three or four pairs of legs, at least. Um, because I would want all kind of extra added on function. <laughs> I mean, the only reason I am what I am now is because of the limitations of my body. If I had the option to burst out of those limits, to run really fast, I don't, even if I only did it once, wouldn't it be cool to say, hey, Usain Bolt, <laughs> come on, let's run and just blow him out of the water, even if it's just that once, to have that functionality to, and if you were designing, and, and there was an industrial designer um, who works on prostheses who said exactly this. If you have to design legs, why wouldn't you get all the function you could from them? Why wouldn't you do that? I had a similar question. Uh -huh. So I guess going off of that, it's just, a question that raises, is it ethical to make someone superhuman? And the whole, like a lot of people that are disabled, all they want to do is just to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, so if they don't want to be you know, abnormal, mm -hmm. society's definition of normal. Right. So if you make them superhuman, I guess not everybody is equal in that level. So mm -hmm. it kind of raises an ethical question with like, you know, I guess genetic engineering and, you know, so the primary purpose is to make everyone equal, but if you're a superhuman because you have the technology to do so, is that really what you're achieving? I think that's a great question. Um, and well, let me ask you a, a question, a, a, a return question, and then we can sort of go out from that. Why do people with so-called disabilities want to be normal? Do they want to be normal because that will allow them to fit in? Do they want to be normal because they don't know that there's the possibility for them to be super able? So sort of, as Amy Mullen said, opening up the question of the possibility of being something more is in a way empowering. So what would you choose? You know, would you choose, so let's say you don't have use of your legs for one reason or another and you're wheelchair bound. We live in a world that's designed for people bipedal, a bipedal world is what we live in. But might it not be a better idea to perhaps have a, a, a prosthesis that is wheeled or is motorized so that you don't have to walk? You can get around in a profoundly different way, but a profoundly more convenient way than having to roll yourself with a wheelchair. What if you, wouldn't it be nice if you could put on, uh, we ha there's a, near where I live, there's a guy who has a Segway. Do you guys know what the Segway is? Well, I would like to be able to get to work by putting on my Segway attachment as opposed to putting on my legs and then having to wait for the bus and then getting on the metro and all of this other stuff when I could just get to work by putting on my Segway attachment. And then when I get to work where it's important to be bipedal again, I could put on some legs. Oh, huh? or, or what I was thinking was uh, I'd love to have each leg be a little mini Segway. Because I, I rollerblade, so it's hard to think outside the frame of if you had to replace your legs. Yeah. But yeah, if, if you integrate the idea of a Segway and its own and, and the way it balances and you can, you can stand on a Segway, imagine if each leg was a little Segway. How fun that would be. <laughs> I don't know about like escalators or like going doing stairs with them, but it would right. be <laughs> pretty fun. But let's go back to your question about ethics. What do you think about that? Oh, the ethics of augmentation, I guess, is the question that she's asking. Is it fair or is it ethical to make people more than? 
What's another thing? Like if everyone all of a sudden you have these legs, you can design. Like, just, if I could redesign this. <laughs> <laughs> if all of a sudden you have legs that you can design that uh, for someone that loses legs that are people that are better than normal legs, then would you have an ethical situation where everyone wants to have lose their legs to have those other legs? Um, we do really strange things to our bodies right yeah. now that give us no physical advantage, right? <laughs> Think of the piercings and the tattoos and the body alterations that people, they file their teeth down. Think of the things that we do right now. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on, you know, the situation. If you're, if you are in a race, you know, or if you're in a competitive, or you're kind of um, competing with others, then it becomes like, ethical question question that for a minute. Why doesn't, well, and I mentioned Usain Bolt before, fastest man in the world, 100 meter world record holder. Why doesn't he have an unfair advantage? In some ways, isn't birth just an arbitrary line? So he's born with a body type and with a genetic makeup that allows him to be as fast as he is. He works hard, but those other 100 meter runner guys, they work hard too. There's nothing super special about what he's doing and how hard he's working that allows him to be faster than those other guys. So how is that fair? Why shouldn't I be able to get myself, get my, 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 get my physical being to a point where we're on a level playing field? And then all that matters is who works harder, who works more efficiently. So, in some ways, birth is just an arbitrary, I mean, we've just chosen it because it's convenient as this is, what's, this is what you should be able to use. It's what you're born with. Well, that's not fair. If what, and so let's look at the Oscar Pistorius. You've got, have you guys, you know who this is? The, the Blade Runner. He was born also uh, with a, a genetic disorder that never allowed him to have, he, he didn't have legs below the knee or I think maybe mid hip or something like that. And he is now um, a, 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 a very famous para-Olympian, but sued for the right to compete in the um, international athletic competitions, including the Olympics, and he won that right. So what do we know about how fast Oscar Pistorius is? And what's normal for him? Right? How do you compare? Since he never had legs, we don't know how fast he was. All we know is how fast he is with the kind of prostheses, those cheetah type legs, the J legs that he has. So should he be able to compete with quote unquote able body athletes? Is that fair to them? Like Amy Mullins was saying, asking this question, is that fair? What, what do you think? Is it fair for him to compete with folks who have their birth legs? I mean, I think it's also, again, it's kind of like just based on the situation, but if you think about it, technology is made like in the best way possible. So if they make a leg that they think will be fastest, like it's, I don't know if this is getting touchy subject, but it's, I guess they wouldn't re really be working their legs as much as like able-bodied people would be. So I guess that also, like how hard they would work to get there mm -hmm. would also be a question because they would have to, I guess like work their upper body, but, and practice with the prostheses, but it also is different than like people with legs and they have to practice like strengthening their legs and things like that. So I think it's, 
to end with that, it, bringing back the author when it comes to set, it kind of depends on what kind of legs you're using to run with. So for Oscar Pistorius, he has pieces of J leg. So mm -hmm. they're really thin, so for like air and resistance. Uh, and weight, I guess. Also. Yeah, and weight. Like it's easier for him to run just because of the weight is like the way his legs are designed. Um, or to, I guess, evade some of the other obstacles um, other people other people would. Um, so the type of prosthesis he has. Doesn't he have another set that are longer that would have put him above and beyond everybody? And they specifically designed his to put him on a similar playing field? Isn't that yes. the solution to the question you're asking? Well, I don't, well, let's ask, is that the solution, right? So how do you get to determine what puts him on? So is it because he's slower than the fastest people in the world that he's on a level playing field? So you compare his conditioning and his routines to the people around him, and you estimate. I don't know what the process was, but there was some process involving, there was a team at MIT, mm -hmm. and I think Penn, maybe, I forget. They did some kind of biological and bioengineering analysis. Yes. That, right? You maybe you know the, mm -hmm. determine that this like puts him in the competitive realm, but it's still his own effort that got him there. Kind of. I mean, I think they tried to do the best they could. I don't know. I've only I don't know. heard bits and pieces yeah. in passing, but I read something. I knew he had something that would have put him above and beyond the field. Well, to think about how that issue is though. So he also competes in the Paralympics. He competes with folks who have only lost one leg. And they complain that he has an advantage over them because he has, he's missing two legs and so the, they don't, he's more, he's balanced in a way that they can never be balanced because they have one leg that with a flexing foot and a calf and all of that and then they have this other leg. So you, so I kind, of, I kind of think it's like a trivial thing. We could spend our time thinking about like better legs versus spending time thinking about, well, let's make sure he can't be faster than the fastest person in the Olympics so there won't be too much uproar over him competing. And That's I think... Kind of what I, what I, I just think it's a trivial argument. With no nothing to back it up whatsoever, I guess it's just opinion. If you can complete, compete on a level playing field with in the regular Olympics, you don't necessarily belong in the Paralympics. I can't give you any good reason why. <laughs> but I think part of the difficulty here is how do you determine what a level playing field is? And, and, and what many people found themselves in the position of arguing is that the guy with no legs has an advantage in the race over the people with legs. Which is sort of a very strange kind of thing to sort of argue, uh, uh, given the way we think about this. Do you have something, Joe? Um, I think it, it goes to this question of the ethics of this, and it might not be exactly what you're saying, but it provoked this thought. There was something about her that was her presentation that I was just disturbed me. Mm -hmm. It felt very much like she, she's in a very elite position, mm -hmm. right? And she's also, in many ways, um, kind of an idealized body type in a way, you know, and also clearly from the first world and wealthy and has access, mm -hmm. you know, and has high art people wanting design likes for her. So um, it, it, it raised for me this question of increasing like the class chasm and the experience of being disabled for so many people around the world who, how far away they are from ever having that sort of uh, attention to mm -hmm. improving their disability, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, I like she's breaking through certain concepts that can maybe be helpful to all, but it, it sort of pointed up for me. It, in some ways, it maybe it would kind of increase the st stigma and the sense of dis being disabled of people who can't get to where she is. Right, so that among the disabled, because of these technologies, you could have this class of super able people and <laughs> this class of people who are way left behind. Of course, 
um, what some folks argue is that with the kinds of technologies that are developing, we'll be even more, uh, we'll, so the opportunities will be much more broadly available. So there'd be like a trickle down of technology or a well, diffusion not, of technology. Not, yeah, I think that's, or a radical, it'll, some think that in particular 3D printing will allow the diffusion of really sophisticated techniques in a way similar to mobile phone communication. So that if you think about people in developing countries, they more or less skip the landline mm. revolution that we had and that lasted here for nearly a century. They I, skipped yeah. it. I had the same reaction to her, I think, or a little bit of the same mm -hmm. reaction that you described. But on your other point, the same would be true about advanced eyewear or yeah. ear, you know, um, what do you call it? hearing aids, etc. Yeah. Any kind All of prosthetic, kind of not just legs. But I have a question for you all that I didn't, I don't get. When I see these cheetah legs on her or any of them, doesn't it hurt? Do they rub away this? How do they design it? You engineers might know this. How do you design a prosthetic that you can put that much pressure and go that speed and not rub away the joint or the skin or whatever? You were. Does anybody know? I think the connection between the leg and the um, and the. Uh, and the prosthe prosthesis is obviously extraordinarily important. But we know quite a bit from how our knees are designed that we can sort of replicate some of that connection to absorb um, the, uh, the force of running in that way. But those cheetah legs she had on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kept saying, this is going to hurt, isn't it? I'm talking about the way they were connected. But they must not, is my point. There must be some sort of shock absorber or some fitting or some anatomical. And they fit on like, like a boot fits on. Yeah. So you can also distribute the stress. But I don't know. I've never, I've, I've never worn one. You didn't bring any for us to I try out. I didn't on. bring any. I didn't have any to bring. <laughs> um, the, 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 the other thing I wanted to ask, on this point of the ethics of augmentation of national. What, what would you be willing to augment on yourself? Right? So you obviously, all of you augment something. right? You, most of us augment our intelligence in one way or another. That's what coffee, Red Bull, tea, <laughs> all that stuff was just the technology is chemical technology as opposed to biomechanical technology. But what would you be, and obviously glasses are a hugely important augmentation. I guess, the, so what would you be willing to, what would you want augmented? And would you care whether or not it was fair <laughs> if you had it augmented? Your brains. Your brains. Your brains. Your brains. <laughs> but that would be fair. <laughs> You wouldn't, you wouldn't care. No, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't care. Well, well I think <laughs> there's a good, but I think this is important though. I think there's a good example though of this, of brain augmentation. There is something of an epidemic of high school and college age folks using ADHD medication, even though they don't have ADHD. It helps them concentrate, it helps them focus, all of that. That's brain augmentation. So if you were in a class and half of your class were using these medications, would you think it's unfair when it comes test time? Mm -hmm. So you probably, I guess you do think it's unfair because probably yeah, half your class, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh, obviously I was kidding you. <laughs> but I think in some cases to think that half of your class is taking that sort of stuff is not an outrageous number. Right is that now. is that is that the case, the students? How many of you know somebody taking? I know overhearing at the RLC. <laughs> 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 I don't know them, but yeah, definitely. And 
those topics. So what should professors do in response? Should professors make, if, if, <laughs> if I knew, right, should I make the test harder? <laughs> If you're in my class and I know that, you know, my class is drugged up on <laughs> attention focusing well, like diseases. Them huh? half of them are. Well the other yeah. suckers are just stupid. They should get some too. <laughs> I mean how do you how do you manage that? Oh like blood test before every exam. <laughs> <laughs> what if you have a prescription and you're oh. allowed to have it? <laughs> so you don't actually have oh go ahead. Also, no, 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 I was just saying but you wouldn't know if they can eat or not. What we're going to have on the syllabi is <laughs> anybody caught doing this? I actually wonder if, if it's more of an American phenomenon. Do you, do, you, do you all know if your cohorts, have you heard about this issue in, in Europe? No. It's probably not nearly the number of people diagnosed with ADHD. Well, there's that, but I wonder about like the pressure or the... Yeah. Do you, you think there's more or less pressure here? Less. Less pressure less here. Pressure here. How, how about the two of you? Everybody, that's non, non US. I don't know how to say. Hard to I, I compare with high school, not with college. There's less pressure here. I think so. Here. So would you. Uh, would you like to be an INDS major? <laughs> 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 would you. <laughs> Would you have been tempted to take um, a medication to help you to focus, to help you do better in high school if you'd had the opportunity? Would you have been tempted to do that? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it had been, and I think that sometimes what happens, it's available, and folks take it. It works, and so. You know, sometimes we think about these ideas of augmentation and would we do it or not, and forget the ways in which we already are augmenting ourselves. But yeah, I want to go back to connecting this idea of uh, performance enhancement and the rules of the game. I think of you know performance enhancing drugs are clearly, as Lance Armstrong uh, learned, are clearly out of bounds and punishable. So. Perf so let me just pose this question: Are the new the new technologies in prosthetics performance enhancing, and so do they break the rules of of uh, the game? Let me give another example from another sport. Also in cycling, uh, recumbent bicycles are not allowed to complete compete in the Tour de France. They're com they're considered technologically. Uh, to uh, there's less air resistance. There's this wind re you spend like something like 75% of your energy overcoming wind resistance in a typical bicycle. So if if that technology is not allowed in the Tour de France, should other technologies also be disallowed from games? Coming back to prosthetics, isn't that really the fundamental? This is an ethical question. Is it wrong to have performance enhancing limbs? In the games, because it's it's technology, not biology, as you had noted right, earlier. Right, right. I think an underlying difficulty here with the question, though, is where's your baseline, right? So this comes back to kind of the Usain Bolt issue. Is he, is he the baseline, or is What's normal, I guess, is the question. So then you can know whether or not you're being augmented from the normal. Or can we, or do we need to clearly draw the line between biology and technology in sports? Right. But I see you. Uh, things like coffee and glasses and such that we do already augment ourselves with, mm -hmm. it puts us on a relatively level playing field. So it puts us in a relatively, so if we had glasses that gave us eyesight better than what, though? 2020. <laughs> so yeah, level playing field, the quantitative measure is, do we all, can we all get to 2020 mm -hmm. vision, rather than x-ray vision or yeah. something right. else, yeah. telescopic and vision. Both humanly possible is, well, anything, yeah. 
but you've got folks who are 20, have 2010 vision. So why shouldn't I, let's say I'm getting LASIK, why would I, why should I have to stop at 2020? Why can't I get the 2010? Because <laughs> we use yeah. stuff doesn't work well anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the point is we can't always rely on it not working well. It's like the, with the steroids mm -hmm. or EPO. The argument is, well, you know, it's also harmful. Well, there are things that aren't particularly harmful. So we have to have a, the solution, or not a solution, an approach for things even when they're not harmful. Um, so you can imagine a type of surgery or a type of augmentation, easily imaginable, where you could get 2010 vision. So it, if this guy naturally He's born with 2010 vision. Why does he get an advantage over me? When I get my eyes corrected, I'm only allowed to have 2020. That seems unfair. Just as unfair as it is that Usain Bolt gets to be naturally whatever he is, and I can't catch up to him. So it's just, oh well, sorry, I gotta bite it because he was born that way. Why is that fair though? It bothers me that you keep wanting things to be fair. It just doesn't exist. But we just talked. I thought that was the sort of, in, in a way, that was sort of the basis of what we were saying. That you know, whether or not this one has an advantage or doesn't have an advantage, or we got to get you back to where, to sort of normal. But that the, under underlying that seems to be this notion of fairness. But or am I wrong there? But the essence of competition is not to prove that everyone's equal. The essence of competition is to see who is biological, and I'm going by the commonly accepted rules, um, I think, which are being debated here, that the essence of play, or competition in this sense, Olympics, is to decide who is fastest, not how equal we all are. Who is fastest, and who's second fastest, and who's third fastest, because they get the medals, right? You can use things like these to bring you up to level playing field, and you have to use this to show better. I also feel like the, the ethical issues are very different in, when you're talking about competition in the competitive mm -hmm. realm mm -hmm. versus like the human community or whatever right. community you're in. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like the primary social concern for, I don't want to speak for disabled people, but I will say this around this ability is to, to, to no longer be kind of excluded or deprived right. or lesser from, lesser than, perceived as lesser than, but to bring back into the inclusiveness of community. Mm -hmm. And within human community, there's a huge range of right. variability in our types and our abilities, right? But you want to come back into kind of a basic, um, um, within that range, you want to bring it back into that range. Mm -hmm. So there's different ethical issues, and that's one reason why she she it disturbs me a little bit because she's we're not talking about her coming back into kind of your the community, but like superseding it or whatever. But I think there are different a whole different set of issues in the sports competition realm than in social human community. Well, I think it's a reasonable <laughs> question to ask though. Why would you want to come back within the range? that you have lost a limb is not something that's going to change. You can't hide the, you're not going to put something on that can make everyone forget and make you forget that you've lost a limb. So I think what perhaps is empowering about her message is that there's no need for you to be limited by the kind of sense that we have of what normal is. You know, we, we, and that the, this idea of what normal is, is community constructed and it's absolutely limiting. And ultimately, those of us who have, are considered disabled can't fully come back into it. So what needs to change, it's not us, but the notion of what the community considers disabled to be. And when we explode that, you'll allow this massive diversity in people without the ostracism. So if someone decides that I don't want any prostheses at all, I'm fine just the way I am. Pow. I want something that's going to make me six inches taller than I was before. 
that's fine too. So what's, what's changed, and maybe what she's arguing needs to be changed, is the limiting notion of what it means to be disabled, or different, perhaps. But her appeal, it, the, you know, she puts these high heel shoes, she has a short dress on, she prances it around. It was not a short dress. <laughs> it wasn't. Was that dress was, not me? Like, no, it was me. But that's not, she, she, did, she was, you didn't see any of her natural leg. You didn't see any of her thigh. So I'm just pushing back on that. Well, you see what I consider short. <laughs> so I felt it to be she wore a dress. <laughs> So that was, in my view, shorter than normal, maybe for the style, not. But she seemed to be up there prancing around, showing off with those shoes and all the rest. She seemed, to, <laughs> she seemed to be calling attention to something beyond having a prosthetic to be able to walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. But she talked about art and beauty and what mm -hmm. is a beautiful person. Well, and what she thought was a beautiful person. You're not supposed to wear those kind of high heels. If you look at safety and look at down the road, what happens to your legs if you wear those high heels? That's not a, that is not a but she have to sensible. Worry. But she doesn't have to worry about that. But some do. These young ladies. But not her. Is it, but is it her fault that she doesn't have to worry about that? Steve. But isn't that the revolutionary essence of her message, where she goes back to the kids being told, don't stare at the disabled person, don't stare at their, their prostheses. She, she's attractive. We are staring at her for the, I guess, for the right reasons. Right. There's, she's flipping it on its head. You're perceiving her attractive. Yes. That's a value judgment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there something wrong with that? Value? Just pointing um, out. But but I think that she's embodying that message of a tr not disabled, attractive. And we're staring, which she's drawing our attention for different reasons, for beauty rather than pity. Or because oh look she's different she's she's disabled, and that was the that was her opening message right? Kids are taught not to stare at disabled people. It's not polite. Is it polite? Oh let me ask this: Is it polite to stare at Amy Mullins, or is it impolite to stare at Amy Mullins? Is that her name? Is it impolite to stare at her? Because everyone's been told since you were kids not to stare at disabled people. So is it impolite to stare at her? It, so, so it was not, oh, and that's my point. So it was, it was, it was not impolite because of your reasons for staring, right? And, and I think that's part of the message she's embodying. Well, let me read this short quote from um, uh, it's a, a Dr. Hugh H Hugh Her, who is um, who is the, the professor of, uh, of um, he's a biophysicist and he heads of, of the Biomechatronics Research Group at MIT Media Lab. He lost his legs when he was 17 in a climbing accident. He got lost on the mountain, and he and uh, a friend were exposed to the elements for four days, and they had to, to amputate his legs. Mm. And he writes in this interview, in the, in the, in the interview, he says this, um, the devices you design don't look like human legs is the question being asked of him. You did that deliberately. Why? And he writes, when I, he writes, when I became an amputee in 1982 and still today, having an unusual body and mind was not looked upon favorably. But there are many people with unusual minds and bodies who, in fact, love their body. I wanted to produce bionic extensions to the human body that celebrate the fact that a part, that part of the person's body is artificial. And then um, he, uh, he's asked a question about um, Pistorius. And he did follow it up with, as an athlete yourself, do you sometimes identify with Pistorius? And he says, I've been accused of cheating. 
I loved that accusation because the day before I was a cripple and they were tapping me on top of my head. Oh, you're just so courageous. That's so demeaning. Then the moment a person with an unusual mind or body becomes competitive, it goes from aren't you courageous to you're, you're cheating. The difference is performance. And then the, the last piece here, you gave a recent speech where you said that the type of research you're doing is going to revolutionize fashion. Fashion? He writes, we're knocking on the door of a new age where we can really rethink what clothes are. Soon you may put on these pants that add support and structure, and the pants are kind of skin-like. And then the skin is smart and knows that you're going for a run and stiffens. That reduces stress in all your joints, allows for greater health in the biological body. Beyond prostheses, generally, we will have robots that attach to our bodies and augment our physicality. Let's say you want to go running, and that causes pain in your left knee. You put on this robot, and that spans your, that spans your knee. That robot takes the stress away from your biological knee, and you could run further without, you could run without further degradation of your tissue. And so there are a, a couple of things that I wanted to hit. I know we're running past our time, but a couple of things I wanted to hit there, and that I think that both he and Amy Mullins are challenged, are sort of wanting us to fuss with. And this is, so you know, you, we're, you, you don't want us when we're cripples and we, you, you know, we sort of embarrass your sensibility. And then you don't want us when we have these prostheses and it allows us to be not just as capable, but perhaps more capable. So we are not the problem. You're the problem. You need to figure it out and stop messing around with us because we're moving ahead and our technologies are allowing us to explode all of those notions that you had. So I think it's the attempt is to focus the lens or the mirror on us, on the so-called able, and away from them, the so-called disabled. Well, thanks guys for coming. Yeah. We hope to have in the fall and in the spring a number